Amen. It's so good to see each of you this morning, and we're glad to have you with us. Uh, again, thank you so much if you are guests with us today. We appreciate you being here this morning, and we want to ask all those that are our guests this morning, just let us know that you are here. Uh, you can do that by sending a message to info at kinstonfirstph.com. You can do that on a text message or email. But just send us a message with your name and your email address so that we can have a way to contact you. We would greatly appreciate that. For each first-time guest, we're going to make a donation of $5 in your honor to Mary's Soup Kitchen here in Kenton. So I'm looking out and I'm trying to see if I recognize, or actually I should say don't recognize <laughs> some faces. And, uh, and so to those of you that this applies to, again, it's info at kinstonfirstph.com. Thank you so much for doing that. Let me say welcome to all of those that are joining us by Facebook Live today. Again, we're glad to have you as, part, as, as a part of our service as well. Uh, again, we thank you for joining us, and we ask you to help us to get the word out by clicking that share button, letting others know that we're having service right now, and they can join in as well. <clears throat> I do have a couple of announcements to mention real quickly this morning. First of all, and you may notice that we don't have quite as many people in the sanctuary this morning. Well, the reason for that is because we're starting Children's Church back today. Amen. Amen. So they're here. They're just not in here. So, uh, and we're so glad to have them down there. Uh, they are, of course, uh, continuing to practice social distancing down there as well. Pastor Trey has done training with all of the volunteers. And so, again, we are so glad to have that. Uh, be starting back up today. I do want to say if you uh, do have children, and again to those that are listening, if they should attend, uh, we are again are continuing to practice the social distancing. They got different parameters in place uh, to help ensure that, but also for us here in the sanctuary, again continue to do that. Thank you so much. I know that you're tired of hearing about it. Believe you me, I am tired of saying it, um, but. Uh, we have been blessed in our congregation to not have anyone that we know of that has been directly exposed here in our services. And so we're, we're thankful to the Lord for that. And we do believe that it has to do with continuing to do that. So again, at the end of the service, make sure you go on out into the, the yard. If you want the fellowship, we do encourage you to fellowship. But just don't congregate in the foyer because we just don't have enough room, obviously, in the foyer for all of you that are in here today. Uh, let me also mention about our nursery. Our nursery is available, but we do not have anyone to staff it right now. We don't have any volunteers in there. 
So that means if you do need to use it, feel free to do so, but you will have to take your child and attend to the needs of your child. And so again, thank you so much for understanding that. We hope to add that back at some point, but we do want to point out that since we're, it, some may have thought since we're starting about children's church, we're gonna have that as well. It is available, it's open to use, but you would need to uh, attend to the needs of your own child. So again, thank you so much for understanding uh, about that right now. All right, that's all the announcements that I have for this morning. I'm gonna ask you all to stand with me, please. <clears throat> would you bow your head? Father, we praise you, we thank you, we give you glory. As the song said, Lord, all praise and all glory belongs to you. We just thank you this morning that we can come into your presence in this place. What a privilege it is to worship you. Lord, we pray that you would touch each and every person that is here today by your spirit, ministering to each and every need. We thank you for this all now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So good to be in the house of the Lord today. I reminded the praise team, and I remind you as well, you know, we're not promised another moment. This may be the last opportunity we have to gather together like this in His name. We never know what's going to happen. So I just want to encourage you today to worship the Lord, to give your all to Him, to take advantage of this opportunity to pray and seek His face. God is here. God is here where two or three are gathered in his name. He's in the midst. I've been thinking about this this week, and um, I'll just share it with you now. Um, we see all the chaos. We see all the division. We see the fear. We see people discouraged and depressed and anxious. And we see so much going on in the world, but can I just tell you that God is up to something? In the middle of all of it, God is up to something. I don't know if you, I don't know if you sense God doing something or not, but I just can sense that God is up to something. It is up to us to respond. It's up to us to give ourselves to Him, to seek His face, as the, the Scripture says, to humble ourselves and pray, to turn from any wicked way and draw near to Him. And He is faithful and He will heal us. I'm just so thankful today. I know we don't get to shake hands and fellowship like normal, but I want you to do something for me. When you turn to somebody around you, just say, the Lord is good. Now when you turn to somebody else and say, yeah, He's worthy of my praise. Amen. God is good and He's worthy of our praise today.
land. He is here. And that you're here this morning. Amen. Amen. What an awesome privilege to be in the very presence of our Creator, of our Savior. Amen. Amen. And to worship Him. Hallelujah. We're going to go to Him in prayer right now. I'm going to let you be seated. Again, we thank you so much for being here today. As uh, we get ready to go to the Lord in prayer, let me say to those that are watching my Facebook, we can encourage you to share your prayer requests with us in the comments section there. And again, we will look at those obviously sometime later and we will be praying for those needs as well. Uh, I also want to mention the same uh, email address that we have mentioned for the guests to send us their information so that we'll know you're here. Uh, you can also submit your emails to that, including your prayer request as well, if you would like. Again, that's info at KinstonFirstPH.com. Um, let me mention these needs to you. Uh, we do, of course, pray for all of those that are on our prayer list, um, but then these as well. Continue to pray for Jack Mazingo, Mary Ham, Robert Peed, Evelyn Harris, Mary Wiggins, and Tony Weeks. Then also continue to pray for Miss Barbara Nash. She is recovering from a recent surgery this past week. Then also remember Miss Dorothy Skeens. She is the mother of Miss Betty Skeens Overman. She is at uh, Lenore Memorial Hospital and not doing well. Then also please remember the family of Miss Edith because this is Miss Brenda Phillips' sister-in-law. Uh, she passed away this past Tuesday. And so let's be in prayer for that family. The arrangements are, the visitation is today from 3 to 6, right, Miss Brendan, uh, at Mills Funeral Home over on Highway 11, and then also tomorrow the funeral will be at 11 o'clock. So please be in prayer for this family. And then also remember the family of Mr. William Boyette. Uh, he passed away on Thursday, I believe it was. So the arrangements are still pending for Mr. William Boyette right now, so please keep that family prayers. Uh, also pray for Debbie Sassnett's son, Charles Murray. He has liver issues that are very severe and he is in the hospital in Texas. So do remember uh, Charles Murray. And then let's continue to pray for our nation. As you have heard us mention recently and uh, there's been other announcements and stuff made about it as well. And we're still in a time of prayer and fasting for our nation all the way through November 3rd, which is the day of the election. And so we want to encourage those that will join us to at least pray. And if you're able to fast, do that as well. We know some may be prevented because of medical issues from fasting, but, um, but anyway, we want to encourage you to at least pray. And again, let's believe God to touch and bless and heal our nation um, and uh, all of the unrest of things like that that are going on. Pastor Brown, of course, as you know, is in the midst of a series talking about some of that. So we really need the Lord's intervention in our nation. And then also let's continue to pray for all of those that are dealing with the virus, uh, any of the, the uh, aspects of the virus, whether it's the actual virus itself and them having caught it and dealing with it, uh, you know, uh, COVID-19, or whether they are suffering from the economic impact and all of that. Let's pray for all of those needs as well. Let's continue also to pray for those that are unable to be with us, that are homebound because they're uh, sick or have some kind of chronic illness that would keep them from being in church, if you would remember them on a regular basis as well. I'm going to ask if those in the sanctuary have a need you would like to indicate by an upraised hand. The Lord knows these needs as well. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we just praise you today. We thank you, Lord. Lord, as that song says, you are that burden that we're able to bring our burdens to. And God, we're just so thankful that we can do that today. For these that we have mentioned, we bring them to you, Lord, like those four men carried that man on that on that man. And they tore the roof off, Lord, to get to Jesus. And Lord, I think that in the 
indicates how that we must be so desperate to just come to you no matter what and bring our needs to you. You're the only one that can really do what's needed to be done. And so God, we just bring those needs to you right now and we lay them at your feet. And Father, we pray for those that are sick or that are, that are dealing with any kind of physical ailment, be it from maybe a surgery that they're recovering from or an injury that they have sustained. Some of which, Lord, we have listed by name this morning. We pray that you would touch them. Minister healing to them. Make them completely whole we ask. Father, today we pray for those that are dealing with other things in their lives. We ask that you would help them to know that you are still with them, that they are not alone, and that they can be comforted, Lord, by your presence. And help them to have that assurance, Lord, that everything's going to be okay because you are working it out on their behalf. The Lord, we of course ask you to do it all according to your will and according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus, by which you said you would supply all of our needs. So, Father, just have your will. Again, for those that have indicated by that raised hand this morning, for those that are on the prayer list that we did not read out, Lord, we just ask that you would touch them as well. And Father, for these that have lost loved ones recently, we do pray especially that your comforting presence and your peace would just sustain them in the days to come. And that they would know, Lord, that you are here and give them strength, Lord, to face these days ahead. We just ask it all in Jesus' name. Bless the remainder of this service. Continue to use it all for your glory. In your name we pray.
You Jehovah Rapha, our healer, Lord. We thank you, Lord. You're Jehovah Nisi, and our banner of victory over us, our leader in this warfare that we're in in this life, Lord. We just thank you today, Lord. You're Jehovah Shah, the God who is with us. We thank you today, Lord, and we bless your name. We lift you up, Lord. You are holy, and you are righteous, and you are just. And you are true, and you are faithful, Lord. And we bless your name today, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. We thank you for your blessing, Lord. Lord, we thank you today. We worship you. We worship you. This song is a song of the testimony. We want to keep worshiping the Lord today.
the book of John. All things are possible. Amen. Praise God. All things are possible in Him. Oh, we thank you. We praise you. We magnify you. You're such a good God. Thank you for your power, your anointing. It's when we find ourselves in crises that you show up, God, and illustrate to the world that you are the sovereign one who is sitting on the throne. And Father, we magnify you. We glorify you. absolutely no way. And Father, you provided the ultimate way where Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father, to you, except through Jesus Christ. Thank you for the cross that is that bridge that gives us eternal life. Father, we glorify you this day. And I pray now once again that you will bless the remainder of this service. Those watching online and those on campus, God, I pray this morning that your spirit would move in their hearts, in their lives, in their home right now, in this sanctuary. We already feel your presence, God, and I trust at home as well. And Lord, I thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the promise of your word that you've given unto us. And Father, we give you praise, we give you glory, and we give you honor. And all God's people said in the house and online, amen and amen. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? One more time. We glorify your name, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, praise team. Thank you, band. Thank you, all those working behind the scenes this morning. And thank you for joining us today. We're so glad that you've chosen to worship with us on this last Sunday in September of 2020. Thank you so much. Those watching online, thank you. I realize there's a lot of things you could be doing right now as you scroll your news feed and Facebook, but you paused and you come here. Thank you. And maybe you're scrolling through, you click on the button for a moment there, and you're listening. You're saying, why am I here? Well, I do believe it's providential, and I invite you to stay with us. Please, don't tune me out. Please stay with me. And uh, again, thank you for sharing this post with your friends on Facebook. I encourage you all likewise. I realize it may not be a live service when you leave here, but you can still share it on Facebook. I invite you tonight, share it on Facebook. I do believe I have a word that... The church needs to hear, and I believe all those watching need to hear. And so I invite you, please, share this on Facebook with your friends, and that will be greatly, greatly appreciated. I do want to make mention before we transition to the Word this morning, I want to say thank you again for your faithfulness and your generosity and your giving. Typically, this is our time of giving where we pass the plate, but as you all know, during this very, uh, very odd time, we're not doing that, but thank you for giving. In the foyer, as you all know, there are boxes that you can place your gift. 
Uh, you can place it as you're coming in, as many of you already done, or maybe as you exit this morning. But thank you. Those watching online, you can always give online by going to the church website. Very simply, Kenston First, PH, that's P as in Paul, H as in Henry, dot com. Kenston First, PH, dot com. Right on the homepage, you'll see where you can give online. You can give with the tithe and then all these other um, giving options that you have there as well to missions, to a range of ministries that you give, can give to. So thank you so much, and thank you all again this morning. Lord, I pray now that you will bless the offering, Lord. Bless those who have given, Father, when they have faced difficult times. Lord, thank you for their faithfulness and their generosity. And Lord, I just praise your name right now for bringing provision into their life in the name of Christ. I come into agreement with them right now that it shall be done. And Lord, I pray now once again for the anointing upon your word. Help me, God, your servant. I know the anointing upon your word, but Father, upon your servant, I need your anointing. And Father, just as much as I need the anointing, those in this room and those online need the anointing to be able to hear, to comprehend, to digest, God, what is being shared this morning. And I know this morning, God, some things that might be shared, everyone may not agree upon, Father. But, Father, I'm preaching your holy word. It doesn't matter what we think, God, in regards to that, Father. It's your word that stands the test of time. Lord, your word stands true. And I realize, God, we all have different opinions about certain things when it comes to political matters and many other things, God. But ultimately, God, we know that your word stands the test of time, Lord. And I pray today that what is being shared would minister to your people and help us all that our eyes may be awakened and that those who've lost their first love of you, God, that today they'll be convicted in their heart, that they will draw back to you, Lord, and those who might be lukewarm, I pray, Father, that you would fire them up. Lord, fire us all up, I pray, in the name of Christ. And if there be one who does not know Jesus as personal Savior, either here, God, on this campus or those watching online, I pray for, for the conclusion of this service today that will say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Be the Lord of my life. I confess I am a sinner and I need a Savior. And Father, your word says that we acknowledge that we're sinners. If we believe on your finished work on the cross, we confess with our mouth, believe in our heart that you are the Son of God, arose from the dead. Father, your word says we shall be saved. I pray someone today would have the courage, the faith, and the honesty to pray that prayer and acknowledge they need a Savior. Thank you now, Lord, in the name of Christ and all God's people said, amen. Amen. And amen. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to the book of Jeremiah 17, verse 7. I want to speak to you for a few minutes this morning in regards to the topic, Is There Hope for America? Let me ask you all this morning before I begin, I have my own curiosity. Did anybody watch online or on television the prayer march 2020 or the return in D.C. yesterday? Let me go ahead and tell you guys, if you missed it, you need to go back online and you need to watch it. It is archived. You can go to Facebook. You can go to Google them up. You can Google. You can bring that up. But you will find archived videos. I know CBN, the Christian Broadcasting Network, was running that yesterday. I believe TBN was also. But also, too, online on Facebook. If you have missed it. I'm telling you, you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't go back and watch it. There were powerful, powerful prayers. You might say, well, Brian, I don't want to hear all this political stuff. There wasn't no political stuff. It was all prayers. It was praying. They didn't endorse any candidates when it comes to candidates and things along that line. What I'm trying to say is they were simply praying. It wasn't, I know... Mike Pence, Vice President Mike Pence might have spoke, but he didn't, it was not a, it was something where he wanted to be a part of it, but this was with Franklin Graham in the prayer March 2020, but I'm telling you, there was a powerful prophetic word spoken yesterday, and if you missed it, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I want you to hear me again, I'm telling you, you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't go back and watch it. So go back online, look that up, the return, again, this was with Jonathan Kahn, a Messianic rabbi. He shared a powerful message yesterday with, he started yesterday, Friday night, went all day yesterday from like 9 to 8 last night. Powerful. And, um, and then marked the prayer March 2020 with Franklin Graham. And just a powerful time. I cannot stress it enough. And I could feel the anointing as they were praying the words that were shared. So please, I'm taking a few moments to share that because I'm telling you, it was awesome. 
As we begin this morning, Jeremiah 17, verse 7. I'm going to read this verse of scripture to you. And then I'm going to go right into today's message. Blessed is that man that trusteth in the Lord and whose, here's the word I'm looking for, whose hope the Lord is. Whose hope the Lord is. I'm going to invite everyone to say this with me this morning. My hope is in the Lord. Once again, my hope is in the Lord. Those watching online and those on campus again, my hope is in the Lord. Years ago, Franklin Graham had a campaign or a festival. Billy Graham was crusades. Franklin Graham's were called festivals. And he had a festival, and basically this festival was my hope is in the Lord. One of the, his, the group that was singed for the Franklin Graham festivals, that was one of the songs that was singed, the theme song. Um, and it was a powerful song. And I remember being at the Cove, the Billy Graham Training Center, and some of the team was there, and they sung the song. Powerful song. It was with Tommy Coons band. Powerful song. And you can find that also online. But I wanted to remind us all today that our hope is in the Lord. Every week we gather like this on a Sunday morning. Something new always happens during the course of the week. There's news that's being shared. There's more chaos, more confusion, more turmoil, more questions, more rhetoric from both sides. We're seeing all that's happening. And I feel as if, as I shared beginning the other Sunday morning in regards to this sermon series, What in the World is Going On? As we're leading up to November 3rd, I believe the church must have a voice and not be silent. I believe the church, as I shared last Sunday morning, has been silent for way too long. And for us to come together like this and not mention the elephant in the room would be crazy. <laughs> you heard it all week long, and you come to church and kumbaya, right? Everything's all good. Look, our world's in a mess. Our nation is in a mess right now. I don't think I've got to convince you of that. But I want to remind us all, my hope is in the Lord. Amen? My hope is in the Lord. Say it again. My hope is in the Lord. When you watch the evening news, you see all that's happening and what they're anticipating in those evening hours as we've seen this past several weeks with the rioting that has happened. But I want to illustrate this morning from God's holy word, asking the question, is there hope for America? And I'm going to ask you, as I share each Sunday morning, I'm going to ask you to lean in and listen very closely. I'm going to be sharing some things like I did last Sunday morning. Things that people may not all agree with. And I understand that. But I'm coming from the scriptures. As you heard me say it, sermon number one of this sermon series, I'm not going to bring forth my opinion. Rather, I'm bringing forth the word of God. I'm going to state facts. It may sound like opinion, but rather I'm stating fact. Okay? This is plain fact. And then we're going to continue to build upon that and ask the question once again, is there a hope for America? And then also asking the question, what can we as believers do? What can we as Christians do? What can we as the church do? And that's the question we all must ask ourselves. Because too much is given, much is required. Is that correct? So we all have a responsibility. If you call yourself a believer, a child of God, then you have a responsibility. And to sit idle, to sit stagnant, that is not what God what God says to do. Rather, we're to put feet to our prayers. We're going to be talking about that this morning. But it was after the 2016 election, there was an abundance of post-vote analyses. That evening on that Tuesday night back in 2016 or that Wednesday morning when you awoke, there was an abundance of post-vote analysis. What did the triumphant candidate do and their operatives to do in order to gain the victory. How was their ground game? What states did they, did they not campaign in enough? How much money did they spend in that state or that region or in their campaign? How did they perform in their debates? How was their momentum going into election day? There were so many political analysts that were attempting to answer these questions as commentators explore these various topics, 
The nation was stunned that Tuesday night, late in the evening, into Wednesday morning, as the candidate that the polls were suggesting would win did not win. When it looked as if the Clintons were going to have another term in the White House, everyone was surprised on Wednesday morning to find and learn that Donald Trump won the President of the United States. You see, all of these very well could have been factors in the election and a loss of a political candidate, the things I just mentioned. But what is very interesting to me, none of the political analysts, no one in the media reported in regards that the Lord had anything to do with the election. That's what's amazing. The ground game, they won't hear enough, they're enough, whatever. Tearing everything apart, dissecting every everything about the, about the campaign, but I never heard a media person or a news network mention that the Lord had anything to do with the election. They attribute the candidate success and election to any number of superficial reasons. They simply refuse to admit that spiritual reason, our spiritual reason could be the cause. Why? Well, let's just examine for a moment. The fact is, based upon the platforms of the candidates in the 2016 election, I'm just going to state, this is fact, okay? It's not opinion. This is fact. If President, or should I say, if Hillary Clinton had won the president, was elected the U.S. president in 2016, here are a few things. This is not an exhaustive list by no means. I mean, I could go on and on and on in the rest of our time remaining. But here's what would happen if we were just finishing the first term of a President Hillary Clinton. The United States would still be in the Iran nuclear deal. The United States Embassy would still be in Tel Aviv and not move to Jerusalem. The United States, the tensions between the U.S. and Israel would have grown even greater. She would not be a pro-life president, and there would be no president speaking at the March of Life like this past January. Two conservative Supreme Court justices would not be on the court today. They would have been very liberal. Religious freedoms would be much more in jeopardy than what they are right now. There could have been, could have been much closer to war or in a major war right now. The globalists would be that much further of having their agenda take place because that is what she is. That is what, again, I'm just stating fact, that is what the previous administration was. It's all leading to globalism. And the candidate who won was a nationalist. Somebody who loved their country. Just like Benjamin Netanyahu right now is facing the fires of individuals trying to get him out of office. The Prime Minister of Israel, who is also a nationalist, who loves his country of Israel, who fought with the Israeli Defense Force. Again, the Prime Minister who loves his country, and the same thing that's happening with our current president is the same thing happening with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. But what I've just stated to you here are a few things where our nation would be right now if we had President Hillary Clinton in office. I believe it would be even much worse than where we are right now. I believe, based upon fact, as I shared last week, we have the most pro-life president this nation has ever had. He was the first president ever to speak at the March of Life back in January. He's the most friendliest president to Israel that this nation has ever had. And my Bible tells me in the book of Genesis, those that bless Israel, God's going to bless them. Can I hear an amen? That's what the Bible says. That's not opinion. That's what the Bible says. So you curse Israel, you're going to be cursed. This is simply fact. I ask the question again. Is there hope for America? Now I realize the other side of the political aisle that they would say things different than what I would say. They have their own agenda and their own opinions. And everyone has the right to have their own opinions. I get that. I understand that. But remember, I'm not measuring it based upon our opinion. I'm measuring it against the Word of God. Okay? That's what I'm saying. So again, we're discussing this from a political point of view. Christianity in America right now is in a crisis. What's amazing to me in Hollywood to say the name of Jesus is a curse word this day and time, and they can use every four-letter word they 
want to on the big screen, but they will not mention the name of Jesus. If they do, they use it in vain. What is happening? That is where we are right now. The name of Jesus is stated is under attack. You can say God. Everybody has their own God, but you dare not say the name of Jesus because you just specify where your hope is. Because my hope, your hope, our hope is in the Lord. Can you say it again? My hope is in the Lord. Can you say it again? My hope is in the Lord. But what I have discovered, and you know as well, sometimes it takes a crisis for men and women to realize it's time to take action. And that's what took place in 2016. That was such a moment. The Christian community, the church, took action. Let's just be honest. Donald Trump was not the most likely candidate of the religious right. We recall many other Republican nominees, or Republicans, should I say, running for the Republican nomination of President of the United States. There were other candidates that would appear to be much more qualified than what he was. He was a brash businessman going down the escalator in New York, making his announcement he was running for President of the United States of America. But here's the thing. He was saying and promising all the right things. He understood that people needed a cause. They needed a creed. And millions of good patriotic people were fed up with the establishment. They were fed up with the Republicans. They were fed up with the Democrats. They were fed up with the Clintons and the Bushes. They didn't want any of those things. They wanted somebody who would hear their voice. And that's what took place. And in 2016, we find the believers went to the voting booth and made their voice heard. We saw where churches all across this nation of ours prayed, interceded, fasted, because they realized in 2016, at that time, it was the most important election this nation would ever have. We now fast forward four years later, and I think we all would agree that this current election is the most important election that this nation has ever had. I think sometimes, every time we have an election, we say that, but I really believe with every fiber of my being that this election is not only electing a candidate, but we are elected where this nation is going to be heading into the future. We are looking at a worldview. You're not voting a political candidate, so to speak. You are voting on a worldview. You're voting on how you desire to see this nation in the future. And I desire this nation to be based upon the Word of God and not based upon the secularist or the globalist, those the anti-God agenda. We, the church, need to rise up and let our voice be heard. Can I hear that again? But one reason I believe that the political pundits and the media did not mention a spiritual reason in 2016, many do not believe in God. Or believe that God is just sitting up in heaven watching and seeing what is going to take place on earth. That he has no role in the life of a country. I could go on and I will share more in the future. I mean in regards to how God was involved in government throughout the scriptures. But as a believer, we know that this is not true. We know there's a God in heaven. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 2, verses 20 through 21, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. So God is fully involved. And he works through men and women. He works through individuals who have a heart like God. You know, this is especially true when we realize that our God is in control. I want you to hear me very closely. I said that last Sunday. I said it the Sunday before that. And I'll say it again this morning. Only God can truly help our country. The answer, as stated... Those two Sundays and today is not found in the state house, not found in the White House. The answer is found in the God's house. And judgment first begins in the house of God. Amen. 
All of us need to have a come to Jesus meeting, basically saying. When we use that terminology, have a come to Jesus meeting, it's basically saying you're getting real. That your Christian faith, if you were on trial for your faith, could they convict you of being a Christian? I trust that they can. Oh, anybody can play the part. Anybody can attend church and anybody can carry a Bible. Anybody can know the Christian lingo. All of us can do that. But if you were truly on trial for your faith, would they find you guilty of being a Christian? And this is where as believers we have to understand that we have a responsibility. I understand that people may not like certain tweets. They may not like certain people's personalities. That people may not like certain things about an individual. But I want to make it very clear once again, you're voting on a worldview. You're not voting just for an individual. There's checks and balances when it comes to our government. You're not voting for a king. You're voting for a president. And I'm speaking of the highest office in the land. We know there's also the governor that's in our state, also local officials. We've got senators and all the things like that that we're voting upon. So I speak of the highest position in the land when it comes to the president. We're not voting for a king. There are checks and balances. There is the House. There is the Senate. The individual does not have full control. So when we understand this today, that God is the one who must lead us and guide us, do you know many people, and I shared this the past weeks as well, many people are totally uninformed when they go into the voting booth. They don't know who they're voting for. They don't know what they stand for. And many people get into political office because of the ignorance of the individuals who are voting. Amen. I shared that with you the other week. That in, up in New Hampshire, in a certain county, that a Satanist, a transsexual, is running for sheriff in the county. And the reason they're running was because the people didn't know who they were voting for. Wow. You need to know. Be informed. Be informed. We know that politics is needed for civil order in our nation. Without government, guess what happens? Chaos. What about? We can see chaos right now happening throughout our nation, even with government in place. I'm reminded of the story of three men. There was a surgeon. There was an architect and there was a politician. And they were arguing over which had the oldest and most distinguished profession. The surgeon said, my profession is the oldest because Eve was taken from Adam's rib and that required surgery. But the architect wasn't impressed. He said, not so fast, my friend. Before Adam and Eve, the world was created out of chaos and that required the work of an architect at which point, that point, the politician chimed in. Well, who do you guys think created the chaos? End quote. <laughs> Unfortunately, sometimes politicians can create the chaos. And we see what happens when chaos is abounding. And we know that that is very, very dangerous. Recall last week in Proverbs 29, verse 2, I read to you the scripture. When the righteous are in authority... The people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. Simply said. So the question I'll ask, we must ask ourselves again. Can any elected person truly turn us around? Let me answer that question. Let's give an example of Ronald Reagan back in 1980. I was a little boy then. I was only five years old. Going to turn six that March. And he was elected. And he came into his position in January of 1980. In the aftermath of the 1980 presidential election, that resulted in what many called a landslide victory for Ronald Reagan, a major news magazine asked the question, Reagan, can he turn us around? Here was the answer. The answer was yes, to some extent. But it was also partly no. It would be unfair for the millions who voted for Reagan, or any person for that matter, to think that his election meant that all the nation's problems would be solved the moment he took office or those eight years that he served. He had to address the profound energy issues, the continuing conflicts in the Middle East, the threat of war with the USSR, Russia, the Soviet Union, the economic instability, 
You may recall back in the late 70s, I don't. Again, I was a little boy, didn't care about interest rates. But I learned that interest rates for a home were sky high. Anybody recall those days? <laughs> Boy, like 3 point something percent now back then, what, 16, 18, 20 percent? Way up there, maybe higher. Increasing immorality and so much more. So no matter the leader, no matter the leader, the task at hand is absolutely insurmountable. So for us to think that someone's going to come in office and completely turn it around, yes and no. They can turn it around, but also partly no. The truth of the matter is, is that it is unwise to think that anyone can single-handedly change a nation or resolve all its problems. Yes, history shows that Ronald Reagan was a very successful president. He had great success in his two terms. I believe that Ronald Reagan was one of our greatest presidents ever, personally speaking. That's not, I guess that's, not, that's an opinion there, so sorry. I said no opinions this morning, but that's my opinion. He improved, and that was at that time. He improved the lives of many Americans. But as we go on, although he had many excellent accomplishments, the U.S. continued to wrestle with the same issues that plagued the nation when he took office. The same issues we wrestle with today. He could not permanently change the nation in his own strength or through his own political channels. And neither could any person. Placing our hope for a new nation in this one candidate would have been a hope misled. The reason I say all that this morning is this. On the local level, on the state level, and on the national level, it's impossible for one person single-handedly to turn anything around. They have to surround themselves with people who are like-minded, who have the same vision, who have the same heart, who have the same passion as the leader. The point I'm trying to make is, anytime we look to a president or elected official to do what only God can do, we are asking for trouble. Our eyes are on the wrong person. Hear me this morning. You said it. I said it. We all said it. My hope is not in a political candidate. My hope is in the Lord. Amen? Amen. I realize God raises up men and women. And also we see that where God removes men and women. And I do believe that God uses individuals. But it's not in their strength. It is not in their wisdom. It's not in their power. Rather, it's the strength of Almighty God. The Bible says in Psalm 146, verses 3 and 4, Do not trust in princesses, in mortal man, in whom there is no salvation. His spirit departs. He returns to the earth. And that very day, his thoughts perish. So hope founded upon a human being is very dangerous. Can I break it down to you in layman's terms? People will disappoint you, won't they? Has anybody ever been disappointed? Anybody you put your faith in that's really hurt you? We've all experienced that. And it hurts us so bad because we didn't think they would do something like that. And the point I'm trying to say this morning is this. I do believe God is moving in this election. As President Eric shared earlier, God is up to something. <laughs> President, that's a President Eric. <laughs> a prophetic word. <laughs> As Pastor Aaron said, 2024 right here. 2024. We get a kind of campaign manager. Like Pastor Aaron said earlier. Slash president. Like he said, I do believe that God is up to something. If you would have listened and watched yesterday, I'm telling you, you would have sensed the power of God. I can't express it to you enough. Our feelings are fleeting. People will disappoint us. We put our faith in men, put our faith in women, but that's very, very dangerous. Our confidence, our hope is in the Lord. As the writer of Hebrews says, the hope we have is an anchor of the soul. This hope that we've got is an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast. Let me say this. Based upon what I'm hearing and reading, and you as well, on November 3rd, that particular evening, I don't know if we're going to know 
who the President of the United States is. When it comes to the other things too, when it comes down to the Senate and Governor, we may not know that as well because certain states are holding back ballots because of mail -in. Just stating fact. But regardless of whoever wins the national election, the President, my anticipation based upon what we're seeing already, there's going to be a lot of chaos throughout our nation. And the reason I say all this is that people, many people, can become very fearful. What's going to happen? What am I going to have to do? You hear things online of people's dreams and things like that, and people can get very nervous and scared. I want to remind everyone in this room and all those watching online right now, number one, you have nothing to fear. God is on the throne. God promises he'll take care of his children. Doesn't mean we're not concerned or misunderstanding. Yes, I'm concerned. But I also recognize that my God is sovereign. He's in control. And I believe this with all my heart. I'm going to expand upon it in just a few more minutes. But I'm looking for one of two things. I'm looking for a mighty move of God, a Holy Spirit filled revival where people are saved, or I'm looking for the rapture of the church. Jesus is going to show up regardless. Jesus is going to show up. Amen? But I do believe that in order to experience a revival, there just might need to be a good shaking. Think about it a moment in your own personal life. Some of us came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior going through great crises in our life. Maybe a shaking in our own life. It might be a health crisis. It might be a relationship crisis. A financial crisis. Maybe an emotional crisis. But something happened that got our attention that drew us to God. God did not send it, but he may have allowed it. And I believe what this nation might be having coming to it. Now God can and will hear the prayers of his people. We know he does. But part of his love is he brings judgment. And the judgment might be what is needed in order to, I'm not just going to say wake up the nation. Can I just put it to you this way and put, the, put it where the rubber meets the road? Where God can wake up the church. Amen. The church is asleep. The church is asleep. It breaks my heart when you hear people on the news talk about the empty seats in a ball stadium and they don't talk about the empty seats in a church house. What's wrong there? Something's wrong, amen? Something is wrong. Watching this past week, the amount of money put into that stadium in Las Vegas, the Las Vegas Raiders playing the New Orleans Saints. I can't recall the exact amount it cost to build that huge brand new stadium. And there was absolutely nobody in the stands. Can I tell you when judgment does fall, can I tell you NBA basketball, NFL football, Major League Baseball, all those sports is the last thing that's going to be on a person's mind when a shake is taking place? It's hard to be a proud man on your back. Do you understand that? God can get people's attention. And if we think right now what we're experiencing is judgment with this coronavirus thing, I'm not trying to negate it. Believe me, I understand that. I talked to people this week who've had the coronavirus. I talked to pastors. I talked to one pastor, or I didn't talk to him directly, but indirectly, who's on oxygen 24-7 right now. My cousin, please be in prayer for her. She has the coronavirus, COVID. Fortunately, she's doing well, hasn't had any symptoms, but she tested positive for it. I ask that you keep her in prayer. God knows who she is. The point I'm trying to make is this is that this crisis we're seeing right now with COVID, if people think that this is the crisis, can I tell you, I believe that this is all manufactured also by the World Health Organization trying their best to bring forth a globalist agenda. That's what we're trying to do because climate change hasn't worked. Because climate change hasn't worked. Let's do something else. And right now, during the holiest time of Israel, the Feast of Trumpets last Friday, Rosh Hashanah, and now the 10 days of all, leading up to the day of atonement, Yom Kippur. And then leading up to the Feast of Tabernacles. Right now, Israel is in a three-week shutdown in the most holiest time of their nation. And do you know also, too, just as Americans were tuning in yesterday to what was happening in D.C., can I tell you it was said yesterday, do you know who else was tuning in? 
The people in Israel were telling him what was happening. They were. You know why? Because they know if somebody gets in the White House who is anti-Israel, they know that they're at stake. That's why it's so important, church, to wake up. To wake up. Wake up. Forget about the empty ball stadiums. Let's be our hearts praying, our knees bent, praying for the empty pews in our churches all across this nation of ours. That's what breaks the heart of God. People have such an apathy about the church anymore. I'm going to tell you something. When this shaking begins, can I tell you the churches are not going to be able to hold the people. Or the rapture takes place. They could come and fill this church and be around this altar after the rapture, but it's too late. Yes, you can get saved during the tribulation period. But you've heard me say many times before, during the tribulation period, you're going to give your life to be a Christian. And my simple, 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 simple explanation to that is, if you can't live for Jesus now, how do you think you're going to die for him then? I'm telling you right now, these empty pews and 50 pews across churches right now because of social distancing. Again, I, again, you've heard me say from the get-go, I believe in physical safety and your spiritual health is the primary importance. But do you see what happened during our most holiest time in our nation during Easter? Churches were shut down. And then just a few weeks later, chaos began to take place. When you remove God out of the equation, something begins to crumble and fall. My kids love playing the game Jenga. You know the game Jenga? And you have these little blocks and you got to move each individual block without the whole thing, the whole tower tumbling over. Can I tell you, if you remove God from the box or from the tower, if you remove God from the foundation, should I say, everything's going to crumble and fall. This nation was built upon the word of almighty God. Not man's opinions, not the secular's idea, not the global agenda. This nation was built upon the word of God. That's what it stands upon today. It just... I thought about it this morning. There are churches in Iran, Nepal, India, Saudi Arabia, the Middle East, where they cannot meet. It's illegal for them to meet because of the country they live in. But the church is still meeting in those countries. It's the underground church. And do you know every week they have to meet in a different place so people will not find them? And they were inconvenienced through what we're going through right now. Can I tell you, this isn't nothing to what these other countries are dealing with right now. Lord, help me. I'm trying to be very careful. The church has done its best. And not all. Please don't misunderstand me. The church has done their best trying to keep people happy and keep them coming. Rather than preaching the whole counsel of God. Amen. Amen. And I follow the pastors and the churches that preach the word of God. I do. And they're there. I know they are. But there's coming a time that people will be held accountable. Yeah. Amen. And church, I realize this morning, those watching online and those watching here in the service, you may not agree with everything. And that's okay. That's fine. But my job is not to make you happy. Or those watching online happy. Right. My job is to make him proud. And I'm going to stand before God. And I want him to, don't misunderstand me. Yes, I want people to like me. Everybody does. But I know in my lower that this life will one day come to an end. And when I stand before God, 
As I shared last Sunday morning, I'm not going to be judged according to how many people I run in my Sunday morning service or how many people I made happy. I'm going to be judged according if I fulfill the will of God in my life. And that goes for every one of you in this room and those watching online. You're going to be held accountable for what you've done for the kingdom of Almighty God. That's what's going to happen. A lot of times we don't want the responsibility. But if you're a Christian, the responsibility is yours. I got off my nose. Let me just tell you this right here. I'm going to come to close. I want you, what can we do as Christians, okay? I got five more weeks to preach on this, so I ain't got to get it all out today. I feel like I'm, like I'm getting it all out today, but I got five more weeks. Remember that no king, no president, no political leader knows everything by means of his own study or his own personal experience. I don't care who they are. No government official can possibly have all the answers necessary to solve all the problems. I do believe right now, this is fact, I'm just stating fact, so don't cast stones at me. I do believe the reason our economy, well, the stock market, our economy is not, let me just rephrase this, before March of this year, our economy was hitting record levels. And I do believe it was because of the businessmen we had in the political office. I believe that. I do. That's just fact. A person might have a different opinion, but it is. The stock market hit all-time highs. My 401k liked it, or my, 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 my retirement thing liked it. My IRA, he liked it. I'm sure yours did, too. He didn't like it back in April when it dropped down to 19,000 points, but it bounced right back up. People talked about how our current president didn't have any knowledge of the Middle East. That's what it was said. Oh, his foreign policy. He's going to get in political office. Look at what's going on with ISIS. Look at what's happening in the Middle East, the tension between Iran, the Iran nuclear deal, where our former administration gave $150 billion to Iran. Cash. Cash, yeah, exactly. On a forklift, bringing it in. I mean, bringing money into them where they can get access to build a nuclear bomb. But listen, but right now, foreign policy, he understood he didn't know everything, but guess what he did? And I'm just stating fact again, okay? Because I'm going back to Genesis. The Bible says the Abrahamic covenant in regards to those who bless Israel, God will bless those who curse Israel, those God will curse. He surrounded himself with evangelicals, pastors, and preachers who knew end time events, who knew about Israel and the Bible. He has surrounded himself with people. There's been more prayer meetings in the White House than probably ever before. And I thank God for that. And again, I, I know it might sound like I'm getting political right now. I know it might sound that way. I'm just giving you fact. And again, I know others on the other side of the political aisle might have a completely different opinion. And I understand that and I respect that. But I'm telling you, he didn't know it all, so he put people around him who were more versed in it. But ultimately, every one of those councils, the Bible says circle, a godly council is so very important. I mean, right now, our Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, born again believer. Our Vice President, born again believer. I know people might question about our President. Is he a Christian or not? I can't say for a fact. Yes, I'll say he has said some things I don't agree with. Yes, he has said some things. But he has surrounded himself with people who are Christians, who are pastors. And you heard me say it before, too, and I'll say it again. It's a play on words when it comes to. You know, with the rap to the church. Think about it. Trump and Pence. Trump Pence, right? At the last Trump. Think about it. Just to play on words. <laughs> but I was at when Vice President Mike Pence spoke two years ago. I know none, uh, uh, um, candidate Trump came back here a few years ago, but I was at... The NRB, the National Religious Broadcasters, two years ago when Mike Pence spoke, VP Mike Pence spoke at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention. Powerful words he gave. I was able to meet some of the people he surrounded himself with. I have personally met Ben Carson. I've talked with him and his wife personally. This is when he was a candidate. And I'm telling you, he is the most kindest, humblest gentleman. What have I ever met? 
I mean, I'll be honest with you, 2016, I was like, Ben Carson. I like Ben Carson. I'm telling you, he was certainly, he is so smart. He, I mean, he's so loving and kind. Man, I'm telling you. But he surrounded himself with some awesome people. But ultimately, God is the one that brings the wisdom. You know what I pray for every single day? God, give me wisdom. I promise you to come up close, land this plane. Remind ourselves that God knows, that God's in control. Remind ourselves where our hope lies. Remember, this is very important, those people who, who, who differ with you and I, there could be some heated arguments right now. You always, how many of y'all finish the sentence? You don't argue what two things? I'm a pastor talking about politics this morning. Boy, I'm setting my set before bullseye. But here's the thing I want you to remember. Remember that in the Father's eyes, remember that in the Father's eyes, people are not our enemies. Sin is. The adversary, the devil. I can give my opinions on certain people's people in the house. I'm not going to name her name. Um, and again, I'm not, I told you I'm going to give my opinion. But what I'm saying is, we have to pray for our leaders. Right? The Bible says to pray for our leaders. Just because I don't agree with them, I pray for President Trump. I pray for President Mike Pence. I pray for um, our governor a whole lot. And, and, you know, and I pray for the other people. I mean, I do. I, I, I pray for them. I got to remember, they're not the enemy. Individuals that I don't agree with are not the enemy. Sin is the enemy, the adversary. People who differ in what you believe, your opinion. Look, they're not the enemy. And we're not to allow these things to bring division. Look, I spoke last week. Racism is wrong. And right now what we're seeing across our nation, racism is wrong. It's a sin. Satan tries to bring division. He's even trying to occur in the church. He's trying to bring division. I mentioned to you last week between Republican and Democrat. Between racists. Between wearing masks. About the coronavirus. Everybody has all different opinions. And the devil's trying to bring division within the church. And we cannot allow it to happen. If there's ever a time for the church to stand up and speak and be in unity and in love, now is that time. If the world is doing it, why should the church be doing it, right? You might not be casting bricks, but you might be casting stones at somebody else. Tearing somebody else down. Got to be very careful. We must recognize that time is short. Thankfully, right now, at the time of this recording, on this last Sunday in September, a person can walk down a street and pass out gospel tracts or Bibles and tell anybody about Christ. People can gather to sing praises and songs and worship Jesus and tell others the good news of salvation to Christ Jesus. Right now, churches can hold God honoring services at any hour or at any day of the week. Well, right now we can. But in California, they're still being fine and all this other stuff that's going on over there. Right now, we're able to publish our services online and provide printed material on the importance of a growing relationship with God. Right now, people are watching online right now from everywhere, watching. Churches from everywhere, they're watching. These different churches and pastors and congregations. But can I tell you, that can be taken away from us. Here's my rally cry to you this morning and those watching online as I come to close, as Pastor Eric prepares. We as believers must accept the challenge and we've got to vote, not our opinion, but rather you've got to vote what the Bible says. You better vote this. As I said earlier, it's not a personality, not the tweets, not any of those things. But rather, it's upholding biblical values. I know right now people got different opinions when it comes to this Supreme Court justice nominee by our president. You got those who say they should wait till a new president is elected. You got those who say he should do it right now. You got different opinions. 
Let me tell you what the first Supreme Court Justice John Jay said. Here's what he said, quote, Providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers. And it's the duty as well as the privilege and the interest of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers, end quote. That's the first Supreme Court Justice of America, John Jay. Church, like yesterday that I heard in D.C., as I've heard other powerful men and women share online as well, church, we must not bow down to the things of this world. Rather, we must rise up. Amen? God is going to, I believe, sin and bring revival to our nation. I believe that's going to happen. But I do believe there might be a mighty shaking in order for that to happen. Whenever things get darker, that is when the church should be brighter. And I understand right now all the reservations that we feel, our emotions. When you watch television, you want to throw something at it. I understand how you feel. You get mad. You get angry. But if there's ever a time for Christians to show Christ-like love, now is that time. We're not to lower our standards and be like the others. Rather, we must maintain Christ-like love. People may not agree with you. That's okay. Everybody's entitled to opinion. It's called the First Amendment, freedom of speech. And I thank God I live in the greatest nation in the entire world, the United States of America, that I can do that and you can do that. Amen? Do we have that freedom? That I can stand before you this morning and preach to you from the Word of God. I'm grateful for that. But in some nations, pastors are being beheaded. Yesterday, one pastor who spoke, and he was from Africa. He was once a Muslim, converted to Christianity. You may have saw it. As he was preaching, these Muslims, radical Muslims, came in and poured acid over his face and disfigured his face for life. He almost died, but he's still preaching the Word of God today. Look, the church must show love. In the midst of all the chaos and the confusion and the conflict, in the midst of all the racism and the tensions that we see, the church must show love one for another. No matter what the skin color might be, show love. No matter what political party they might be with, we must show love. No matter what the religion may be, show Christ-like love. Christ-like love. Jesus said, if I be high and lifted up, I, Christ says, will draw all men into myself. We're not to lower ourselves, but rather we're to say, God, show up in a mighty way. And I believe just like he did in 2016, God is going to show up in 2020 in a mighty, powerful way. I don't know what it's going to look like at the end of this year. I don't know who's going to win. I have no idea. But regardless of the situation, God is going to show up in a mighty way. Church, do you believe that today? Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet all across the room. So we've come this morning and we shared. Here's no hope for America. I never answered the question specifically. I did it directly. Let me say it. Yes, there's hope for America. And it's found in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 It's in Jesus. It's in Jesus. My hope's in the Lord. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Amen. Amen. I showed this brother the other day. I have a little hand figuring in my office. And it says, okay. And every once in a while, well, a lot of times, I got to look at it. Ron, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Church, it's going to be okay. God's in control. But you got a responsibility. You got to pray and you got to vote. Amen? You got to pray and you got to vote. You need to register. You need to register to vote. I mentioned last Sunday morning in regards, let me give you this date one more time. You can go online and register as well. Let me give you this information to help you when it comes to knowing the dates. I know this may not be spiritual sounding, but let me give you these dates right here. Election day, November 3rd. Deadline to register online, October 9th. Deadline registering by mail, October 9th. Deadline registering in person, October 9th. Register to vote. You can go online. Very easy to do so. You can go to the Board of Elections right here in town. The deadline to request a ballot by mail is received by Tuesday, October 27th. 
Early voting begins in North Carolina. It runs from Thursday, October the 15th to Saturday, October the 31st. So those are your dates that you need to keep in mind. The church needs to vote. And I realize today again across this room that people might have different opinions. And I do as well. But I'm going to tell you one more time before we pray. This is what you're voting on right here. This is what I'm voting on right here. How can anyone justify agreeing that abortion is okay? I can't see it. It's called murder. And I thank God that God forgives those who might have had an abortion. I shared that last Sunday morning. If you've had an abortion, God will forgive you, and he has forgiven you if you've asked the Lord to forgive you. He's, he's like, he's forgiven me of sin. He's forgiven you of sin. But in New York, full-term abortions have been the worst. How can that doctor go home at night and put his head on his pillow and say, I'm going back to work the next day and do it all over again? It's beyond me. I'm just glad I'm not God. We gotta pray, we gotta vote, we gotta fast. Maybe you're watching, and maybe you don't know Christ as personal Savior. Maybe in this room you don't know Christ as Savior. Today the Lord desires to forgive you of any sin in one's life, no matter what it might be. Is He first place in your life this morning? If not, Today you can confess your sins to Jesus and ask Him to forgive you. By saying, Father, forgive me. I receive your Son, Jesus Christ, as my personal Savior. I acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God and arose from the dead. I receive in faith my salvation. And the Bible says you're saved. Dear Jesus, I pray right now amongst this congregation. Many people in this room today are facing some hard times. We talk specifically today about our nation, the local, state, and national, Lord. But Father, our nation needs a healing, Lord. But Father, right now, those people in this room and those watching online who need a healing in their physical bodies, they need a healing in their emotions, maybe the loss of a loved one. Maybe, God, today it's financial difficulty they're facing. Maybe at their job they're facing some tough times. Lord, I'm asking you right now that their hope is in you. Father, their hope is in you, Lord. Their hope is not in the, in the place they work. Their hope, God, is not in the paycheck they get that, 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 that their income from. God, you are their provider. Father, I'm asking you right now that we all remind where our hope lies. And I thank you, Lord, for Jesus. And Father, I pray there be one right now who is watching, who is listening, or who is under the sound of my voice in this room. If they don't know Christ, I pray this morning, they'll say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Be the Lord of my life. I'm going to ask before I come to close in prayer, is there anyone in this room on the floor or in the balcony who will say, Pastor Brian, I'm asking the Lord to forgive me. I've been not living a life that I should be living. And Brian, I want to make sure everything's right between me and the Lord. If that is you this morning, would you lift your hand in this room and say, Brian, please pray for me. I need Jesus. I need a Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe you're here this morning. You've never accepted Christ as your personal Savior. Or maybe you're lying. You've never accepted Christ as your personal Savior. And you want to know Christ as your Lord and Savior. Is there anyone in this room today, would you have the courage and faith to lift your hand and say, Brian, please pray for me. Anyone at all. Maybe there's someone in this room today, maybe you've compromised and you backslid. You know what the love of God is, but you made some choices. And right now, you know you're not living where you should be. Maybe you backslid. Anyone in this room today, say, Pastor Brian, please pray for me right now. Thank you, Jesus. Well, as we sing this final chorus, Lord, I'm asking that you would move across this congregation and speak to the hearts of your people. Thank you, Father, for the power of your word today. Now, Lord, I ask that you would do what only you can do. 
We thank you for it, God. In the name of Christ. We're going to sing this chorus. And as we're singing, as we begin to exit this morning, there might be those who would like to come to the altar to pray. Myself and Pastor Jerry will be here. We will pray with you as your row exits. Instead of going out the door, if you would like to come up and have one of us pray with you, we'll be glad to pray with you. We're still being you know, conscious of the social distancing aspect of it. We both will be wearing masks this morning when you come and pray. So again, if you would like to pray as we sing this final course, and as you exit from the back up to the front, if you would like to come and pray as you exit out of your row, you can make your way down. Let's sing this course together, knowing that our hope is in the name of of the Lord. You are righteous. We will remember. We will. Remember. 
Amen. Amen.